our laws as it pertains to substances are draconian and bizarre. The psychopaths start this way. He was an alcoholic. Because of social media and pornography, PTSD, love addiction, fentanyl and heroin, ridiculous <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a doctor for <laughs> sake. Where the hell you think I learned that? I'm just saying, you go to treatment before you kill people. I am a clinician. I observe things about these chemicals. Let's just deal with what's real. We used to get these calls on Loveline all the time. Educate adolescents and to prevent and to treat. If you have trouble, you can't stop and you want to help stop it. I can help. I got a lot to say. I got a lot more to say. Welcome, everybody. Uh, yeah, I do I ever have a lot to say and more to say. But uh, we seem to be something going on with the restream where I'm a completely silent over there. So I wonder if we have... Uh, there they come. All right, now they've been they've been notified accordingly. Uh, today is sort of a AMA. Sort of ask me anything. i got a few things on my mind, but I'm interested. No. Susan, I can't... Uh, AMA means that? Ask me anything. Oh. AMA. And we are I'm, lightning. I'm very proud of you for knowing that. Yeah. You're so hip, <laughs> Proud of me Drew. for knowing that? I know I've seen yes. AMA and I I did an a, I did an AMA thought that's what it was. with Adam was it with Adam or Mike it was must have been or Striker but it was about 14 years ago it was one of the first Whoa. AMAs yeah and I, I had no those, idea what they were talking that about that code word and uh, I was, AMA. was I was informed then so hey hey all you out on restream I don't see any Twitch I see YouTube and Facebook. Oh, Twitch. I just got the notification from Twitch. What do I know about Novavax? I am hoping it is released Weird. soon as well, Mary Kay. Novavax is a simple protein that stimulates the immune system to respond to that protein. If um, if I decided to get another booster or a booster, I haven't had a booster yet, uh, I would not. Uh, I would get the Novavax. Uh, Covaxin is another sort of whole viral sort of old style platform that uh, I think is being used in India right now to great effect. Uh, Dr. Uh, Monica Gandhi is a big a big advocate of that particular vaccine. It's another one you can get if you are concerned about the mRNA vaccines. Uh, so Maria G, what do you do for anxiety, 59 year old? So anxiety is really prominent right now. Uh, it comes up on anything. And Tanya, I know you're here. Maybe you could come in and uh, take a call on Clubhouse and talk about as a social worker, what you're seeing in terms of the uh, incidence of anxiety out there in the world but particularly my psychiatric colleagues that deal with uh, child and adolescents are saying the same thing anxiety depression anxiety depression anxiety depression they're just overwhelmed with it and they cannot get there are not enough psychiatrists and psychologists to see all the cases many of them aren't even coming in because they're maybe disdainful or don't understand you know how to treat mental health issues so uh it is I, the way to think about anxiety is it's sort of mm, really probably four categories to think about. One is, of course, general anxiety, with or without panic, and pan panic attacks are a special thing. There she is, there's Maria's question there. Panic attacks are a special, you can have panic attacks without a generalized anxiety disorder, or, you, or more typically is with a generalized anxiety. And those of you that have had panic know what that is, you feel like you're dying. And panic has a slightly different treatment, it's sort of an open circuit in the brain, so it has a different, um, treatment that generally is anxiety per, per se, but let's just talk about anxiety per se. So there's anxiety that is that causes depression. There's an anxiety associated with a lack of connection to emotions. It's sort of the, the connection between primary emotions and second order representations and regulating those emotions are deficient because of primarily not getting enough of what you needed during the sort of rapprochement phase of development. When kids go out in the world and do things and they come back to their primary caretakers and say, look what I did, look at them, refuel me, help me regulate myself. Didn't, if you don't get a lot of that, and if you have a lot of uh, sort of chaos in your caretakers and you're busy taking care of them, again, your primary emotions are off in the distance somewhere. They aren't valued. They aren't identified. You can't bring them to the fore. You can't regulate them. And you're left with a whole lot of anxiety. That's one kind of anxiety. It tends to cause depression. Uh, excuse me, I beg your pardon tends to be associated with depression. So it may be a uh, depression sort of is coming on and you only experience the anxiety again because you're sort of disconnected from emotions. There is a anxiety that causes depression. There are people that are very anxiety intolerant and when they feel anxious and overwhelmed, they drift into sort of um, almost like learned helplessness. They start to feel helpless when they're anxious and that makes them depressed. So there's depression causing anxiety, there's anxiety causing depression. And in either of those cases, there can be anxiety associated with obsessive compulsive disorder. 
So the anxiety associated with OCD is yet another sort of use specific biology. It's more associated with the generalized anxiety disorder that causes depression, but it can be with or without depression. So OCD and anxiety is a, a category. And then these days, we're seeing a ton of uh, post-traumatic stress disorder and anxiety, right? People that, that are in this sort of hypervigilant state, their autonomic nervous system is turned on all the time. That is a residual of childhood trauma. And if you know the book by Dr. Vanderkoek, The Body make, Keeps the Score, The Body Keeps the Score, he talks about that very explicitly, how it is the body constantly in that state of trauma, even though your brain is saying to itself, I dealt with that a long time ago, I don't think about it, I might not even remember it. There is the body keeps the score. Um, there's another good book uh, by Dr. Levine called Waking the Tiger, I think it's called, if I remember right. Uh, but but these are, yeah, Sympathetic Overdrive, uh, uh, Ali Lever Green calls it, Aleve R. Green. Um, yeah, a sympathetic overdrive is, is part of it. The problem is the parasympathetic system, the vagus nerve, is really more the mediator of a lot of this stuff, it turns out. Um, if you look at Dr. Porges's work, you can see how the vagus development is embedded in our face, vocal cords, and ears. And this instrument of our face, our voice, and our ears is how we have socio-emotional exchange. And when I talked about the coming back for refueling from primary caretakers, parents, um, it is the vagus nerve that is stimulated in the caretaker to give the prosodic uh, intonation in the voice, the facial reflection of the emotions that happen automatically. That's because the vagus is embedded in the branchial pouches of development, which become our face. And the brain stem is the source of the vagus nerve. It has three nuclei that from which it emanates. And a lot of that vagus stuff is there at birth, though some of it develops later as a regulatory function. And that later developing stuff doesn't develop so well if you have trauma, mostly because rather than triggering regulation and socio-emotional interaction, the vagus triggers dissociation. And that now is Alan Shore's material. We talked to Alan Shore on this podcast about six months ago or so, probably, it seems like it was last summer maybe. So check that all out, Alan Shore. Peter Fonagy, um, Bessel van der Kolk. Uh, who else did I mention? Peter, it's Stephen Porges. These are the these are the these are the prophets of this material of what's called interpersonal neurobiology. And I strongly, strongly, if you're interested, like look into it. Slapdash keeps asking me about Wellbutrin and seizures. Wellbutrin um, usually doesn't cause seizure unless something else is going on, like you have a seizure disorder or an eating disorder. Uh, usually that's where you see the seizures from Wellbutrin, but it does happen. Uh, mm, interesting, Make MK, some sort of persistent testicular pain after vasectomy. That does not sound like fun. Uh, thank you, Maria G. Does matchmaking action is both sympathetic and parasympathetic? Um, different drodo <laughs> thanks for the provocative question as you always bring uh it is sympathetic and parasympathetic switching that that causes sexual arousal and, and discharge um zen 916 is asking me what's my opinion on true niagen okay i am um not working with true niagen i i did advertise they did advertise i think on this streaming show for a while or no and and for a while over on the dr drew podcast so i have been taking true niagen for about six or seven years and uh, I am convinced, I had a chance to speak to the scientist about nicotinamide riboside, and I was convinced he was on to something. I do believe the NAD pathway is important in aging. I think it's one of the things that we can affect. Uh, if you notice, people are getting NAD infusions, both to recover from addiction and alcoholism, and it works, helps with alcoholic liver disease. I don't know if you noticed that Joe Rogan got three NAD infusions in his COVID recovery. I thought that was very interesting, and all the people that attacked his doctor for what he did missed the one really sort of outside-the-box therapeutic he did, which was giving him three NAD infusions. Nobody commented on that, fascinatingly, because they weren't in a hysterical focus of on the I-word medication. Uh, so there you go. Um, okay. Raquel, Rochelle is saying she's been on Suboxone for 20 years. Any studies you can enter? Rochelle, why? You won't, Maybe you just want to get off uh, Suboxone so you can fully flourish or maybe get down a very low dose. Uh, Carol Bowman, you're saying pay a lot for therapy. I'm not quite sure what you're asking there about how do people improve without meds? 
or paying a lot for therapy. Okay. Um, of course, there are lots of things people can do. Engagement. Uh, you know, I swear to I swear that uh, the the new preoccupation with the uh, stoic therapy, stoic philosophers, is sort of a cognitive behavioral therapy that people do with themselves. Bond patches. I'll tell you about NED in a second. You can obviously uh, focus on your relationships. You can also focus on service. Uh, there's lots of things you can do to create. The more you move towards creating a good life, the more you will be improving your mental health generally. But if you have really wiring issues, it needs to be treated. I mean, th these things should be treated. If you had trauma, it needs to be treated. If you have general anxiety with, uh, you know, that you missed a phase of development, you gotta, you gotta catch up on that with in skilled hands. Uh, heard that blood clotting can be genetic. Sure, it can be. NAD is a, it's a hydrogen transfer physiology. It's very, very much involved it's it's involved in basic metabolism, uh, and they I, I I don't know if I could, you know what? Maybe we should get the scientists back in here to really go over the connection with NAD and aging and cell senescence. It, it's, it's, it's the oxidation reduction state of a cell is very much tied into the health of the cell and whether it gets old and dies out. Right? Uh, it's just sort of it's part of what gets depleted with senescence, the NAD, NADH pathway, and the ability to keep that metabolism going. It's the simplest way I can say it, but I'd be interested in bringing the scientists back in here to talk about it explicitly. What do I consider a low dose of Suboxone? Um, under eight milligrams, you're getting there, but I'd like to see people under four milligrams. Uh, that, you know, the one, two milligrams, that's where it really doesn't affect people's functioning very much. Mm, 0.5 still had withdrawal. Oh yeah, oh yeah, Blake. You will. You can get all the way down to 0.5, but when you stop, you will get withdrawal, and it's a miserable two weeks. Uh, and you'll go through it, and that's it. You'll be done. Um, yeah, there. They, I've had that happen many times. People get under a milligram, and you still have withdrawal when you stop completely. Anything else on your on the restream here? Uh, Max Patrick, I don't know quite what's going on with your uh, parents there. Um, Interesting. Uh, do I know? Am I vaxxed? Yes, I had the uh, Janssen vaccine, the Johnson and Johnson vaccine, uh, and I had a terrible reaction to it. Uh, and so, and and then I've had, um, and then I had uh, COVID twice. I had alpha COVID and I had omega uh, Omicron. Omicron was a nothing. And I've had recently my antibodies tested with something called the Additic score, which gives you multiple uh, antibody profiles, including nuclear capsid and various spike proteins and my and neutralizing antibodies. And all that was way, way, way up. So I am, I'm pretty protected right now. What do I think about psychedelic medication? All right, Shane, I did a, a interview with the, um, the founder of MAPS, Multidisciplinary Association with Psychedelic Studies. Um, on my podcast, and he was a he's a very conscientious, very careful uh, scientist, and he said so far we can tell one thing, that in the right hands, MDMA can be useful in recalcitrant PTSD. That's it. That's all we can tell at this point. So for people to be using these things, you're only putting yourself in harm's way. We don't know what you're doing. And I can tell you for sure, I'm sure that, uh, for instance, in end of life, mushrooms and LSD, if you have a terminal diagnosis, you only have a few months to live, those help they help you deal with that dread now it may change your personality but so what now if you're having a chemical change your personality without your control it's outside of your control like with therapy can change your personality too but you're in control of that but with a chemical changing who you are fundamentally I have a real ethical problem with that. And I have seen lots of diverse personality changes from hallucinogens of various type that have concerned me greatly. Uh, as far as the microdosing go, I have no idea. Uh, I've seen lots of neurological problems with uh, modest sustained hallucinogen use. And as all I can tell now is you're putting yourself in harm's way. Uh, no, Casey. Uh, weren't I on Loveline? Uh, yes, of course. Uh, Max, I don't know what you're asking there. Oh, I don't. I would need a lot more information. I'd have to talk to your parents specifically to be able to say anything meaningful about that question. Uh, I don't even want to say it out loud because it's. I can't. I. It's just a not. I. I would need so much more information, uh, you know, about about those two people. I'd have to talk to them and understand them. And if you remember, Loveline was a call-in show where we got that information. What is Kroll like behind the scenes? Um, not nearly so funny. No, he's not funny. Uh, PRN Tramadol. Um, 
Jill, uh, just know that uh, both Kratom and Tramadol are weak opiates, um, and they are certainly not as dangerous as the stronger opioids and opiates. But if you have uh, you have no family history of addiction, no personal history of addiction, I don't see any problem with either of those uh, if they help you. If they help you. Uh, why does Corolla walk all over you on his podcast? That's what he's always done, right? Susan, they're asking why Adam walks all over me. Isn't that what we've always done over there? Even on Love Line? That's what friends are for. for. That's right. So, so, so? We're, we're getting a few people on Clubhouse. I'm okay. trying to put the word out there. All right. so. I'm getting Tanya. Raise your hand. Yeah, Tanya's in. So, Tanya, anxiety and depression. What are we seeing out there? Hi. Hey. Oh, my goodness. Wow. Um, yeah. Whenever you talk about all that, it's so fascinating to me. Because growing up with you, uh, you know, hearing you on Love Line and, and all your projects, you kind of helped me to realize that trauma, child abuse, isn't always what we think of, you know, the obvious yeah. abuse, things yeah. like that. Mm -hmm. um, I'll never forget one time I called Loveline really young. And I remember saying something like, oh, you were abused as a kid. And I was like, no, you know, I didn't <laughs> think of it like that. Yeah. Um, so it only took me like 35 years to finally out the importance, yeah. you know, emotional regulation and self-soothing and really addressing that deeply rooted trauma. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that I'm, I'm working in the field, I feel like it's just, it's come to fruition. I feel like it just, it all makes sense. You know? why, why did you talk about the, the sort of subtle nature of uh, developmental trauma? Because somebody, I did an Instagram live a few minutes ago and someone was saying, do your mom and dad have relate, have any effect on your psychology? And I thought, oh my God, people, people need to hear that, that basic stuff again. It's like, oh my goodness. But why don't you talk well, about how subtle it can be and how easy it is to miss real significant uh, deficiencies? Well, I was listening to you yesterday, and I'm, I'm sorry to make it personal, but you were talking about, you know, growing up with a mother who, mm -hmm. um, where there's some narcissistic behaviors. And, you know, unfortunately, I, I know I'm very familiar with that mm -hmm, <laughs> on mm -hmm. top of some other trauma, but it definitely begins with attachment and mm -hmm. also the way our caregivers um, show affection or behave with us in the mm -hmm. household. And so with COVID, you know, we're seeing a lot of the aftermath of our, our babies, our kids um, not being in the best socially, emotionally healthy environments. Um, and then you add the pandemic and it's all these stressors. So we're seeing a lot of, you know, kind of blanket diagnosis of adjustment disorder. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. But when you talked about how... Uh, depression can come with the onset of anxiety, you know, uh, features and vice versa. That's definitely something that we're also seeing. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, and, and the, 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 I'm thinking, trying to think of a good word for this, the, the, uh, crass maybe disregard for the effects of what we were doing for COVID to the well-being of particularly our children and adolescents. And I just heard uh, Dr. Fauci that day some, say something very di very disappointing, which was essentially, well, of course there's collateral damage. We're taking massive inter you know, interventions here. It's like, whoa, dude, uh, that that's pretty <laughs> glib. That's a pretty glib assessment of why didn't you consider that beforehand? Why didn't you help prepare for this? Why didn't you mitigate those effects? Because they are just... Woo, we're going to be profound. with us for profound, yeah. Unfortunately, you know, I think from a bureaucratic perspective, they just kind of saw this as a liability. I know mm. particularly here in Los Angeles County, but um, my wish one day is that there's this implementation of curriculum where children are um, taught emotional regulation and self-soothing, and they're learning about what you talked about, the vagus nerve exercises and activating that parasympathetic nervous system and breathing and tapping and grounding those things are just I, I don't know why we don't know more about that well uh i know that in england they're doing some of that uh they're 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 really being very proactive in certain institutions and then studying it so we should have data on that soon enough i, I think they're probably 
three years into that work right now. So that will be interesting. But I, I agree with you. I Look, I, I think just a life 101 class, you know, yeah. this is what biology is. This is how a body works. This is what cancer is. This is your brain. This is how your brain works. This is how it works on drugs. This is how it works interpersonally. Here's how to sign a checkbook. You know, I'm just basic. You know, there's nowhere that kids are really given the basics. Um, and, and you can make it as academic as you want, right? I mean, this is obviously, you can go very deep. Uh, if somebody is motivated to teach, you know, some of the underlying chemistry, say, or whatever, is, you know, they're interested in, but it's it's um, left out for some reason. I, yeah, I, it's just very matter of factly, and I, 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 along with that, I guess education about substance abuse and domestic violence and um, just yep. some of these other trends yep. we're seeing with our with our kids, and so um, yeah. Well, you could. I'm just thinking of an opportunity. To, you know, I, I'm a big Hegelian believer, and I believe that. We have these movements and then we move back the other direction and then we create a sort of a synthesis. So uh, it occurs to me that part of a class like that should be sort of the impact of the histor history on the present moment, history of our psychology. Mm. And uh, issues of race and immigration are a perfect opportunity to talk about that. And so how about they do that and then include all this other stuff in the same, in the same class and guess what? I bet everybody would be in favor of that. Rather than people going, I'm not in favor of this. I am in favor of that. You know, you know what I mean. Let's let's talk about the whole picture. And, and all right. Well, you just planted a seed. Now I have all these ideas and good. And, um, I love yeah, it. So <laughs> I love yeah, it. Maybe one day we'll be implementing this. Yes, yes. Good for yeah. you. Because think about it. I mean, the 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 systemic racism and all those 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 topics are a perfect opportunity to talk about intergenerational trauma. Trauma. And yeah. and and then go from that to. Well, we also see that in these form of immigration and these kinds of families and these sorts of historical moments and just bring it all together. I mean, it's, it's, and no one seems to get it. And that's, the, that's terrible. How can you run a country, you know? How yeah, can you we make it sound so simple, Drew. I, I, because it is really, it, it really yeah. is, right? I mean, it's once people sort of, you know, as you were saying in your own case, you were, you're somewhat, you're resistant to looking at your parents as being traumatizing, right? So we'd have to find a strategy for delivering that in a way that people don't feel threatened by it. But I, and, and let me, and let me, Tanya, let me say this. You're out of here? Wait, go say goodbye yeah. on the mic. Hold on. So I'm going to make Susan Gates say goodbye to us because she's going away for oh. the weekend. I'm doing a teen mom uh, reunion this weekend, so she takes Please off. Please tell her. Wait, I here just she is. Uploaded. Hold on. Hold on. Oh, okay. So she's on the mic. Go ahead. Well, uh, Wait, Tanya's had a message for you. Okay. Hi, Mrs. Pinsky. Hi. I wanted to let you know that I uploaded a photo of Drew's bobblehead with Bear Mug and Dave King of Mexico. Oh. <laughs> it's on Twitter. Oh, okay. It's fantastic. Okay, we should retweet that. <laughs> All right, let's do it. <laughs> oh yeah. Okay, you guys, see you later. Okay, but Susan, Take bye, care. bye, bye. I will talk to you. I'll be listening in the car. All right, I'll probably call you tonight and I'll see you tomorrow. Uh, I got to drive for I'm, two uh, hours. In fact, I don't know what time I'm due at the. I'm doing one of these teen mom reunions oh, yeah. tomorrow. Yeah. Okay, have a good so drive safe. Bye. They don't need to know We'll this. miss you. We'll miss you. Okay, miss All you right. too. All right, take care, Stephen. All right, so what I was okay. saying, uh, Tanya, is w one of the ways that, one of the things I've been emphasizing lately, and one of the ways I think we could sort of approach this issue of intergenerational trauma is to point out that all human behavior is adaptive, essentially. Everything's adaptive. And it, and it really is people trying to survive. That's really what it's all about. And people survive in ways that become problematic in certain situations, but even those problematic behaviors can have assets and liabilities associated with them, and the impact on the child can have assets and liabilities associated with it. So it's not all good and all bad. I, I want to just caution people. Like so, so I you've heard me say lately about narcissism. There's a lot of talk chatter all of a sudden about narcissism. And not if, look, if, uh, if somebody's going to be a fighter pilot, I want them to be a severe narcissist. I want that. That's who I want in that F-18. But if it's marrying somebody I care about, well, that guy's going to be tough. <laughs> that guy's gonna, there's going to be some, yeah, something I going on there. Just normalizing and validating without judgment. Right. And that's where we have, right. um, you know, the humanistic techniques that are implemented with therapy and solutions focused and that unconditional positive regard. It's just matter of fact. 
this is what it is. And your brain is so great at adapting. Yes. You know? Yes. Yeah. And, and I, I, I'm, I've always been a little uncomfortable with unconditional positive regard because I do believe you can be very forgiving. You can be very grateful. You can understand somebody else. Your, let's take my own mom. Uh, her, I can understand her point of view. I can understand what she went through. I have empathy for her. Guess what? You don't that you don't do that to a kid. Yeah. Don't, don't so, do that. To, it's not unconditionally positive. It's like, mm, dude, mm, mm, mm. You didn't, there you needs to be some accountability. Yeah, you shouldn't have done that. I understand. I'm fine. I'm forgiven. I'm good. Thank you for everything good that you did do, but you don't do that to a kid. Let's all agree. Mm, 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 and see if we can get that to stop. That's all. Well, so, I hope that you're very proud of your your inner baby child, Drew, because you're you're doing amazing and, and there's a ripple effect. So Well, it's go. funny. I woke up this morning worrying about everything uh thank you uh sensational cinema uh, i'm just re re responding to stuff as we go along here um really worried about this country and i'm hoping and praying for us getting to a point and this what you and i are talking about maybe one of the roads there us all getting to the point where we appreciate what we have in this country we all are we may and that we understand it better collectively that we all understand it in the same way and so that's sort of my thinking right now i've sort of my thinking adjusted this morning where i'm like that that's what i want for us for this country and, gratitude uh, gratitude and but but understanding you know like we like we get each other and we all are rowing in the same direction and we understand the history of this country similarly we have a collective understanding of it um and if those of you who are listening to other countries too i i don't want to i don't want to please don't imagine i'm talking about american exceptionalism i'm sort of disgusted by that a little bit by the way but but i'm just saying we need to kind of get together here if you're if you're looking from outside our borders things must look pretty weird and guess what they are uh and i'm just wanting us to get our act back together again that's all and and maybe it is about um understanding you know, so much of what screws us up is that we're a lot of us are immigrants and we're we immigrated under traumatic circumstances. You don't think those Ukrainians are going to be traumatized by all that? I'm Ukrainian. We we had the I was the last exodus from Ukraine. I was it was the turn of the 20th century. We were the last exodus. And uh, whatever happened there, they didn't speak about it, but it sure rained down on me emotionally. So oh. that's what happens. That's how that's how it works. Yes, yeah. Tanya. Yeah, I mean, I could go on about this. We could talk about um, trauma in utero, you know, the exposure there we could talk about. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I'm not going to say too much about this, but I've been meaning to say, I feel like we just need more, more of God, more of values, more of spirituality, whatever, however you want to identify with how a higher power. Well, that, like we that so is, lacking that. yes. And, and, and I don't want to get preachy about that because I feel like people get turned off by that. But it right. is, it is very prominently in my thinking uh, and it's so funny that you know three years ago i said to uh carol about two years ago i said you know what we need we need another great awakening in this country i started looking at the history of great awakenings and it, they came at a time like this like these great awakenings um and i don't i don't mean that they're good for us i just thought well i was just thinking maybe that would sort of collectivize us maybe that would get us out of this and, and not that i would participate in a great awakening because they were often sort of went into outer space with their they became evangelical and that kind of stuff which can have its own problems but isn't it interesting that instead of the great awoken a great awakening we got the great awakening mm. isn't, isn't that interesting and the awakening is explicitly godless and without religion so it's sort of the opposite of a great awakening but with a similar sort of course to it it's very interesting to me and when, when it's written about i hope people sort of juxtapose great awakenings with the great awakening and the excesses on both it's the, yeah. it's the excesses that are the problem not the points they're making the excesses like back when the great awakenings had developed yes there was a spiritual vacuum a lot of it the problem back then was related to alcoholism frankly there was a lot of movements towards uh what do they call those societies temperance societies the temperance societies built up because they had alcoholics out in the street and uh, it, it's really let me just a quick sidebar i think i've told on this on this pod on this stream before um andy bales at the union rescue mission downtown of los angeles was telling me that his father was part of one of those temperance movements at the end of the 20th 19th century uh, excuse me end of the yeah end of the 19th century and he said um yeah back in the day they would pull the wagon around skid row 
And the guys that were ready to get on the wagon, they put them back in the mission. So that's where mm. on the wagon came from, that the alcoholics would pile onto the wagon when they'd had enough and go to the missions and uh, get some sobriety. Isn't that interesting? Wow. Yeah. I, well, URM is such a great agency. I've worked with them for yep. the last few years. Love but them. Love them. Anyway, Drew, I got to get back to work. Great time. Uh, I appreciate everything as you always. You got it. Pleasure to talk okay. to you. You bet. Ooh, lots of questions here. So, oh my goodness. Uh, let me get to uh, Jeremy. Hi, Jeremy. What's going on? Un unmeet yourself. There you are. What's up? Yeah, I might have to mute myself because I am in public, but uh, I don't want to get the backseat uh, sort of thing about around me. But uh, I want to kind of make two comments before my question. Uh, first, uh, I support like all of the content that you do. Uh, back in 2016, I worked with Gio on the uh, Loveline archive. Wow. I brought in for him about 2,000 episodes. Oh, my so goodness. It's always great to help you guys out. I love media archiving and all of that. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, no problem. No problem. I, I uh, appreciate all the content that you've given people over the years. That's for sure. Um, so you talked about Team Mom and such, and I'm one foot in and out of the world of reality TV casting and development. And... Uh, just a little comment is that I think a lot of people don't know in regards to mental health that people that go on reality shows a lot of times don't know what it is that they're getting into. They go on a show like a survivor and a big brother, you know, and mentally you kind of change during that process. And the networks a lot of times do not offer uh, aftercare to contestants. And it really screws a lot of people up. I'm sure you've seen it with the addiction, you know. Yeah. Like tell you i i wanted to do a show called after reality where we just examine people that had been let go let they, they're just in free fall after a reality show they they sort of in their mind think they're stars and they're gonna you know be like this forever and then it's just everyone just leaves them now uh let me be super clear that the the two shows that i've been involved with celebrity rehab and teen mom and, and this is hats off to VH1 and to MTV, who I've told them repeatedly they should take a bow for this, have spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on ongoing care and aftercare, depending on what the needs were. They've never held back on anything I've asked for, for people that have needed it in either in either cast, in either camp. And they really deserve, it. it, it that is a different approach or uh, which not even approach it's it's different than many other networks and i thank them and they should take a bow for it i don't know why they don't but they have never done so so trust me the, at least the shows i've been involved with with those two networks they have never held back on exactly this issue for exactly the reason you're bringing it up jeremy it's a serious issue yeah and you know along those same lines i tried at one point developing a show of my own that i was calling reality rehab and I wanted to take more of an intervention approach of showing people and the reasons why they decided to go on reality TV to like the height of their stardom or even if it's 15 minutes of fame, you know, show their decline and actually give them the help that they need to educate people for when they actually do decide to apply for their favorite show. So or, I was leaving on with that comment yeah. simply because I was going to say the same thing you did. It's like, why don't we have a show about this already? That's well, sure. why don't you email me at contact at Dr. Com and we'll, we'll talk about it. Cause I, I think people need to uh, see this. I really do. It, it's, it's, you know, the reality casting as you know, well, does not exactly uh, cast healthy people. And then it doesn't necessarily, if you don't prepare for what comes, you can make uh, people that aren't so healthy, less healthy. So, uh, absolutely. Right. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, I do have a uh, separate question, though. Yeah. Um, so I pulled myself out of a bad place mentally back in 2017. And, you know, this is a little cringeworthy for a lot of people, but really what helped me pull out of it was studying a lot of things around the law of attraction. And, mm. you know, a lot of the things like the secret, it's so generic and, you know, it doesn't give you that uh, knowledge that you need of taking action and getting off the couch and, you know, they feel like you just sit there and vibrate at a certain frequency and you get everything you want. Right. But I've done a lot of research as in reading things like Mindsight by uh, Dan Siddall to Tony Robbins books to The Leading Brain and all of that. And so I was wondering if by chance you can kind of cut through a lot of the nonsense and tell people a bit of what is true and what is false in that matter, especially when it comes to something like the reticular activating yeah. system, yeah. as if like... There is a process of needing a lot of repetition for the reticular activating yes. system, or is that something that you know you can take a law of action, a law of attraction approach, and you know just basically 
you know, put it out there and let it go. Well, Jeremy, it's a, I, the reason I, you know, the, the law of attraction has a foundation in something that is true. Uh, it just takes it to a point of absurdity and frankly, it's sort of awful, an awful place where people are blamed for having been in the in the in the way of a tsunami. You know, it's because they chose to be in that place. Like, no, 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 no. It, it, look, the, this is this is ultimately it goes back to positive psychology. You, you ever the whole field of positive psychology, right? You, yeah, did you read yeah. anything about that? Yeah, uh, the, and yeah. It, and it is is sort of in the you know it, this is a. This is a kind of a goofy zone, but the, it's the, the zone is essentially if you the, your your mood and your motivation will follow your thoughts, and if you get your thoughts squared up and your intentions more even than your thoughts, your intentions squared up, you will sort of you'll follow a little bit, and it's essentially action oriented self care. You know, it's today I'm going to go get a coffee and every and today I'm going to make and if you look at happiness literature, uh, whenever I've uh, talked, I've mentioned before on this thread that if I talk to people that um, do actual research and happiness, you know, what's the number one, often their question they get is what's the number one thing I can do? What's the first thing I can do to help my happiness? Do you have any idea what they tell uh, these people, Jeremy? From your perspective, are you still with me? I'm sorry, you kind of cut out there. What I'm the sorry. Question? I was saying that the positive uh, happiness researchers, when they are asked, what's the first thing you can do to help move yourself towards happiness? What do you think they say? Well, I mean, it's like, you know, change your brain, change life sort of perspective. Yeah. And, you know, if you, I, as I tell people, you know, you have to have the positive outweigh the negative. And yep. you're always going to have negative thoughts and thought patterns. You yep. know, it's that cognitive behavioral therapy yep. approach of That's right. you know, the line between the stimulus, you know, and your reaction, yep. you know, and taking that deep breath, you know, but if you start at 50% and you build from there, you're always going to be on the right track. You yep. know, that's how I've always looked at it. And I believe that people are coming to what you're talking about. I think that's why stoic philosophers have become so interesting to people. Because it does put the locus of control back on people, and they have felt out of control for so long. I think it's very appealing right now. But uh, back to answer the question about the happiness literature, the, the first thing they tell you to do is make your bed. Make your bed. And that has an impact on happiness. So it's that kind of action-oriented, positive movement towards things you're grateful for, to, for towards uh, forgiveness and these positive emotions. You're right, Jeremy. It has a real effect. Hey, man, I look forward to talking to you in the future, all right? All right, yeah, I will definitely send right. that contact right. over uh, okay. right away. All right. Appreciate it. Jeremy, everybody, that was interesting stuff. Uh, let's bring Alana up here. Got lots of you uh, set up. I'll try to get to you. Alana, what's going on? Hey. Okay, there. Hey. <clears throat> hey, now. Hey, now. How are you? I'm good. Hey, now. Good. So the question goes back to um, – the intergenerational trauma. Yeah. How as an individual can you stop that? And I just sort of, it's more of a double check for myself. I grew up in an incredibly traumatic, I had a lot of trauma growing up yeah. and I'm trying really hard not to pass it on to my kids. Yeah. So I'm open to any suggestions and ideas. It, it, it's, it's impossible not to transmit some of it, right? Because it, it's it's imprinted on us. It's left on our body. It's left on our emotional systems. So to some extent, it passes on. I mean, your your kids, this is something that I've noticed also people are interested in talking about is attachment and how attachment work. You know, an attachment is, is this ability to be close to other human beings. And that closeness is first established really with mom. Uh, and again, the research is on mom, and we're going to talk about it as mom. And the the things that she is able to do in terms of being completely available to a child's needs and emotions are very much affected by the extent to which she was attached to back in her, her own infancy. And then dad's, of course, the same thing. Um, but trauma makes closeness somewhat threatening changes how your body reacts to closeness and those reactions are necessarily transmitted to the child right there's body to body transmission of information in attachment 
So really, all you can do is get your trauma treated. That's the important thing. I, I, don't, I don't believe that you can really sort of think yourself, I mean, you can. I mean, we're just talking to Jeremy about that. It takes a long time. I just think the really the way you interrupt the, the, um, the pattern of intergenerational trauma is with treatment. Even if it's a little bit of treatment, like some EMDR or meditative therapies or something, something that interrupts this transmission, which tends to be pretty, pretty efficient from previous traumas. And again, back to these being adaptive, let's, you know, when humans are faced with trauma, they are, um, and they survive it, whatever adaptive mechanisms let them survive it, you want to pass that to your kids. Unfortunately, they don't become so adaptive in situations where there isn't that same kind of threat. Got it. Okay. Yeah. So I, I've done that. So, and Good. I had, yeah, no, 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 no. Like my mother uh, got sick when I was six and died when I was 12. So that, you know, you have that six years of that no attachment. And it was a constant, she's going to die. No, she's going to live. She's going to die. She's not going to live. So I've had to um, learn, you know, sort of relearn attachment so that i could give it to my kids yes you know, worked really really hard to also stop and i was just curious also make sure you have managed grief right yes grief is a, i've had years and years and years and years of therapy okay good. and emdr yeah, and yeah so do so, so stop worrying about it stop it <laughs> stop it you've done your work right and to whatever extent there's a little residual good so it makes life interesting. You know what I mean? We, I, I, there's no okay. such thing as a perfect parent. There's no such thing as a perfect child. There's no such thing as perfect attachment. It's just, it, we, it's much, life is much, that would not be an interesting thing. Human beings would not be very interesting if that we were all the same. You know what I mean? Okay. Right. Just, so again, just, just try to make sure. Don't think pejoratively about all these things. You, you should feel very proud of what you've done. Okay. Well, thank you. All right. Thank you. Hmm. Okay, so uh, thank you, E. Jackson. Thanks so much for having Zelenko in. And uh, let's see, to share, whoops, he's giving me a inconvenient info aims at eliminating, we need more free and open debate. Yes, I agree with that, E. Jackson, I agree. I, I, my, my instinct always is when people are, are being suppressed and they are per, they're legitimate professionals and with proper training and previously were editors of journals and things and all of a sudden they're being suppressed, I immediately I want to see why I want to talk to them. I want to know what their ideas are. I still might not agree with them. I, and that's fine. That's good. It's good when I don't agree, but I want them to expand my sort of uh, point of view for sure. Uh, all right, here we go. We're still trying to get everybody up here through your questions. They've been great questions today as always. Uh, Corey, is that who I'm putting up here next? Corey. Uh, Again, the calls, I'm looking at you all on uh, Restream as well. So when I look down, that's what that is. I'll tell you what, uh, while I wait for Corey to come up, let's take a little break. It's going to be very quick, and uh, we'll be right back. Let me take a minute to tell you about Blue Mics. Over the two years we've been working with our friends at Blue Mics, the world has completely adapted to working and meeting virtually. So whether you know it or not, you probably spent a lot of time in front of a microphone. I take it from someone who has spent probably half my life on a microphone, Sounding good is extremely important. And because of blue mics, I have never sounded better. But a good mic isn't just for broadcasting. Quality audio makes a big impact on whomever is listening on the other end, from coworkers to clients to friends. Clear sound can make all the difference. Thanks to blue mics, you don't need complicated or expensive equipment to get professional results. For simple plug and play setups, try blue mics Yeti series. It plugs right into your USB port on your computer. Need something more robust? Blue's got an entire line of professional XLR mics like the Mouse or the Blueberry we use here in our studio, as well as the more compact Encore 300. I love it for clear quality sound when we travel. Bottom line, there is no excuse to be the one on the conference call who sounds like you're in a tunnel or underwater. I cannot say enough about Blue Mics, and once you try one, you will never go back. To take your audio to the next level, just go to drdrew.com blue. That is drdrew.com slash B-L-U-E. I have asked a couple of you up, uh, both Corey Banks and uh, Boom Green. So if you guys are walked away, oh, there you are. Boom, what's going on? You've got your uh, microphone on mute. So let me know what's going on there. Hey, what's hey, up? Can you hear me? I do. What's up? How's it going? Uh, I'm pretty good. How are you? Good. Um, yeah, um, well, 
I have some experience with trauma, but my main question actually wasn't regarding trauma. Okay. <laughs> it was regarding um, a trip I'm planning to take uh, okay. to Nairobi, actually. Um, I got a chance to go train with a local rugby team there. Fantastic. How um, cool. Yeah. So um, last time I played rugby, it was like in college, like maybe two years ago, mm -hmm. I would say, like before all this COVID stuff happened. Mm -hmm. Um and I know that where I'm going to be training is like really high in elevation. Um, I have been like hiking, trying to like be active. I haven't really been training or anything. Mm -hmm. um, and I wanted to know if you had any uh, recommendations. How, how high are you going to uh, be? I looked up like average height in Nairobi. It's like up over like 5,000 meters. All right. So, and you're like 22 years old or 20, 23? 23, yeah. Yeah. You are not, have you been, had ever had altitude sickness or had trouble at altitudes before? I mean, if I go like snowboarding or something, sometimes my head hurts afterwards, but that's it. Okay. So that's like above 9,000 feet probably if you were yeah. like, yeah. So yes. Uh, and if you were staying at 11,000 feet or something, you would probably notice it a little bit, but at 5,000 feet in your age group, you're not likely to experience much. Uh, the two treatments that are available, I don't, I don't know that I would prescribe either for you if, if you were sitting in my office. One would be oxygen supplementation, right? That's that's the the main thing is if you start really feeling out of it, the, an mm. oxygen tank. And if you can get that, then you're done. Um, the other is a medication called Diamox or acetazolamide that shifts the hemoglobin desaturation curve. So your tissues are sort of giving um, off oxygen from the hemoglobin, delivering more oxygen from the hemoglobin at lower oxygen concentrations. So it's called Diamox. You can talk to your doctor about that. But again, it's a, it's a diuretic, and you're going to be working really hard. And I don't know, you know, twenty three year olds, you know, they they they, they become uh, Denver Broncos overnight, and they don't seem to have any problem with that. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. They're 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 all of a sudden they're in a football team that's at a mile high stadium, and they're fine. It just takes okay. a while to adjust. So, but good for you, man! How exciting! I'm a big, yeah, I'm a big rugby fan. As a matter of fact, nobody knows oh, that. Oh, really? Me. Yeah, my son played rugby wow. in college, and we used to watch a lot of it. And I still don't <laughs> what, understand what it. What <laughs> If I, let me try to, he, I can only describe to you what it was. Um, yeah, no so for a while, he was the guy uh, throwing the ball into the scrum. Okay. Right. And then yeah. later he was more sort of at a wing position, like out to the side. Oh, yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I, 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 and, uh, and he was often <laughs> the one that they, uh, lifted up during the inbounding mm -hmm. thing. Yeah. Is that I'm what, a prop. So I, I would be lifting him up. Usually, okay. So, there yeah. you go. There you go. Good times, man. It's uh, that'd be yeah. fascinating to see, you know, have you been to Africa before? No, this is going to be my first trip. Oh, it's going to be um, cool. Yeah. And then like a quick follow up question would just be, do you have any, um, like recommendations for like, going into like a contact sport, anything I could start working on. I've been stretching, like doing stretching for about an hour and a day or hour a day. And then usually go on like a hike for usually like five to six miles. Usually. Yeah. I try to get at least 10, 10 all, to 20 miles. Oh, good. I mean, I, I really, I'm sure there, I, I'm way outside of my expertise in this. So I'm sure there oh, are okay, people, okay. I'm sure there are people that could, could give you really specific, you know, how much strength training versus how much conditioning I, I, you know, I, I would think you would need both. Uh, again, it, rugby is a lot of strength stuff going on there, but the amount of running is ridiculous. Um, so I, it's out, I just know that you'll need both. I don't know how to do that or what balance to get, but um, I just think you're going to have a great experience. That's the main thing. And uh, you're a young man. Why not do something like that? Uh, good for you. Uh, okay. This is Anthony is a psychotherapist. Let's see what he's got to say. Anthony, what's going on, man? Your your mic is muted. I'm sorry. There you are. Sorry, Doctor Drew. Thanks for having me on. Of course, it's happening. Uh, um, so you've helped us with the uh, nonprofit and the nonprofit world quite a bit. And so what I'm kind of asking is, uh, I'm kind of stepping up to the plate and taking your advice on doing something. Good. We're kind of setting up men's health. That's a topic that we're talking about. We want to okay. invite you on the show on our podcast. Okay. Um, the Spread Hope Like Fire podcast. Okay. You, and uh, talking men's health. We want a doctor's opinion on a lot of the stuff we're okay. talking about. Uh, I, I am a starting a, some stuff where we're doing more men's health stuff. You notice yesterday we were doing urology. Um, yes. Margaret complained that we did enough women's uh, urology, but we did some, and Susan did a moderate amount. Uh, and that particular urologist thing 
is is men. That's her thing. It wasn't so much mm-hmm. women. But yeah, send me an invite over at uh, contact to drdrew.com and Susan will get on that. She's very good about sending me that stuff. So please, please do that. Um, I'm going to have to blow through some of these calls. There are a lot of great calls up there. Josh, what's going on? Hey, Dr. Drew. Hey. Um, I wanted to know what you were thinking about narcissism these days because mm. I I heard you mention it a couple times, but you didn't say anything. You okay. want to question. I do, I do. Why don't you just tell me what's on your mind? What's on, Well, no, what's on my mind is that I'm surprised that people are thinking and talking about it so much. I mean, we had a president for a while that had lots of those features and a lot of politicians that have lots of those features. And um, and why all of a sudden is it coming up now? I find curious. And that, so what I'm, what I'm, and again, I wrote a book on it like 12 years ago because I, it was there. I could see it coming. I could see it getting worse. Never imagined that there it is, the mirror effect. I never imagined the histrionic component, which has come up during COVID, but, uh, the, but I saw narcissism come and I saw it, you know, essentially become something we all have features of it in our personality. And that's why I'm warning people against getting too negative about it because this is, we've all got parts of this right now. Um, the main thing I worry about are, are well, the really the thing that I, when I start worrying about narcissism, what I start worrying about is envy. That is really what I start worrying about. And I saw an interesting TikTok today. Uh, I didn't really understand where it came from, but it caught my attention where this woman was saying that really underneath, and it was, this was from the Yale Emotions Lab. And she was saying that, that resentment, which I'm seeing just shit tons of today, under resentment is not anger, but envy. And that jumped out at me like, oh boy, she's absolutely correct. That envy, it's manifesting as resentment, but it's really envy. And envy is this terribly destructive emotion that eats the person up feeling it and always directs aggression and, and destructive impulses towards the other person. It's a terrible, terrible emotion. And just because you're narcissistic doesn't mean you have to have that. You can you can pay attention to when it comes up. And you know, one of the things we say in the recovery world is, uh, you know, resentment is like taking a poison and expecting it to kill somebody else. When you're envious, you don't care. But guess what? You know, only people with really narcissistic disorders don't care. Most people would go, oh, 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 you're right, you're right. I have to be careful of this and, and sort of adjust it. This is back to what, what Jeremy was saying. There's a certain amount of cognitive work we can do to correct course, at least on a large level, on a large uh, scale. But what's your thought, Josh? So I would just say about the envy that I think it's unconscious. Mm -hmm. So just to just to quickly make a mention of this. So when Dr. Drew says, you know, we're envious, we're envious, I'm not envious. Mm. You have to fit you have to understand at least that it could be unconscious envy. And unconscious envy is a real thing. Uh, like in psychoanalysis, but mm-hmm. it's a real thing. So mm-hmm. that means that you're not conscious of the envy that you have, but you behave with it there. In other words, you're envy of this person. You don't know why you're treating this person, say, negatively or manipulating them because you're not conscious of the envy that you have. So for most people, I'm not a psychologist, but I, but I, you know, I, you I like, talk to you, you like sometimes. this stuff. You like this I stuff. like this stuff. <laughs> and I, I like the fact that I don't know that I'm envious of you, Dr. Drew. Mm-hmm. I don't know that I'm envious of this person. Mm-hmm. And because I don't know it, it's very difficult for me to manage it. I, I a thousand percent agree with you. And that of course is the most pernicious kind of envy, right? Because we're not really aware that it's operating. But I would I would imagine, I don't have any data to support this position, but I'd imagine that most people, if they were paying enough attention to some of their negative impulses. Again, this is back to what Jeremy was saying. If they're paying attention to it and and desired to get to do less of it. See, that's part of the problem lately. This is why my my attitude has changed a little bit this morning, which was we need to have a collective desire to do better. We need to stop it. We need to start looking at things we can appreciate together and come together about it's it's enough, enough already. But you have to you have to be wanting to diminish that envy and resentment somehow and to work on it or else it's gratifying in certain ways too and so particularly if you're a narcissist it's very gratifying and i'm not saying you have to have glee in acting out your envy but it's gratifying on some level when somebody suffers that you feel resentment towards or envy towards and that is fucked up (laughs) that's a clinical term you can quote me on it uh and uh that that's yeah i'm i'm with you i spend more time thinking about envy my friend and uh and you know envy in in psychoanalysis is a really interesting topic right the first thing the child envies is the breast 
right? Yeah. And I, I think that, um, you know, for me, you know, if you really want to talk about like the mother and the child, mm -hmm. I would say what's most damaging, sort of the ate the etiology or etiology, that's etiology. a new term. Um, um, it just yeah, means so, cause. So it just cause. means cause. Yeah. So we were talking about the cause of this. Mm -hmm. What could be the cause of this? Mm -hmm. And I really think it goes back to the mother with bad boundaries. Yes, yes. Keep all right. I'm gonna. I'm, we're gonna stop because you, you go to back to the drawing board, and because because that's a gigantic topic. <laughs> that's a huge, well, huge, huge topic. It's how we and, manage. It's, it's how we manage the mother's bad boundaries. Yeah. Do yeah, we but, become but, grandiose? But slow, Do slow. We, no, you're already getting yeah. the territory. It gets weird. Uh, just, I, I think you're absolutely correct. And, and some of it, some of those boundary issues manifest early, and some of those boundary issues manifest later in the child's development. So go, go think about that. Go read about that. And because uh, because if we start being kind of prescriptive and, and descriptive, we're going to get off the rails quickly. Uh, it's it's a very 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 complicated landscape there. But I think you are completely right. And part of narcissism is having poor boundaries. Part of trauma is having poor boundaries. So as we've been saying this whole afternoon that the boundary issues are very deep in all this so i completely completely agree with you josh completely M more to be said oh my buddy anthony brown on the on the on the on the horn here anthony don't just there you are all right what's up what's up my friend hey dr drew how you doing good what's happening oh another day in paradise hey i was i was um tripping on this whole um this this deal about trauma yeah Okay, because I'm, I'm I'm like <laughs> Mr. Trauma, or I discovered the other day that I've had trauma there's your my book. whole life. Yep, and there's your book. Well, not your whole life. You had it. You're certainly your whole. Well, yeah, your whole life <laughs> till you got <laughs> off the streets. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And so then I'm thinking, like, I don't want to say I'm a trauma survivor because I don't want to get caught up in that label. Okay, but I think I think you were a you were a trauma junkie. I think you got <laughs> I think you got attached to the trauma. You got high off it eventually. Yeah, I probably did take it a little bit too far. <laughs> <laughs> hey, please watch and listen to Anthony's interview. I don't think it's been. Is it? Have they put it up yet? The, the podcast. Yeah, it's up. Yeah, we yeah. did a. You did a great interview. He really told his story sort of once and for all. You can listen to Anthony's story at uh, drdrew.com. Uh, Dr. Drew podcast with Anthony Brown. Really, really, really. I was very moved by that interview, and and I knew your story already. You know what I mean? It was really, I thought, very interesting but anyway so get back to your question so go ahead okay so yeah because i was um doing an interview with um from um dr bell from down here mm -hmm. and he does this big old trauma thing and as we were talking i'm like holy crap it's like my whole life i'm trauma now i'm like okay i inflicted some trauma now i'm on the other side and i and i keep reading things like people are trauma survivors and and that's cool but i'm really um apprehensive about attaching labels to myself you know that's fine don't because, yeah uh, I, I mean you're you, you but here's the thing about first of all the thing about recovery and the reason i'm joking with you one of the one of the really wonderful mechanisms of recovery is humor right a lot right. of humor in recovery and, and so you, you'll find ways of identifying yourself that are funny and are still true about the trauma it does, doesn't make the trauma okay but you can you can kind of laugh about some of the things because people are humans are funny and they're just funny as hell um, so, and recovery community just uses that humor very richly. Um, now, in terms of how we could describe it without labeling, let's think about that. Um, w tell me more what you're feeling. It's like you have an aversion to it somehow because you don't want to be helpless or whatever. You don't want to be labeled. What are you thinking? I, I just, I just don't want to um, convince myself that you know, I. I mean, I know what happened, but I don't want to relive it. Yeah, you know, there's I mean, no reason to. I don't think you right. should. I don't think you should. Uh, I I do think that your spiritual experience is is the ingredient that makes it um, almost silly to call you a trauma survivor, if that makes sense. Right, you, right, you right. You know what I mean? Because because that was that was such a big experience and took you so far above all of that. Um, it sort of doesn't, it doesn't describe your life to, to, to label it like that. It, it's, it's really just, it's just, I, I don't know, man, think about it. Cause I, it's your next book. I suspect <laughs> your next book is whatever that is. Uh, how'd your interviews go? Um, it, it went, it went well. I did the one, um, yesterday, um, with the guys over on, on Fox and 
that was pretty cool. I um, it's and it's really funny because I was so worried about that. I'm trying to teach a class and I couldn't even remember how to do simple division. I'm mm -hmm. like so embarrassed. Mm -hmm. So I have to I have to go back and apologize to the students that I, I couldn't remember how to move a decimal point. Because you were nervous. You were nervous about the the interview. Right, oh. right. My my head wasn't into the game that I should be playing instead yeah. of waiting for the one that's going to start. Yeah, one thing at a time. Right, time. right. But I'm 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 learning. But it was it was fun. It was comfortable. I um I made some suggestions as I've heard from a prestigious gentleman that I want to be like, <laughs> and um, I learned from you, my friend. <laughs> after after, so all all's going to be well. And I just you know I'm I'm great. But you know me. I'm grateful that I get to experience everything. Yeah, yeah. My uh. Cool. And that, that whole part of what I went through, I look at it as like, maybe it's just part of a flower blooming. And that was just a stage of my development that I had to go through to be this rose that I am today. It absolutely is. Uh, and as so long as it it is something that you can use to help other people, then it only is a good, well, it still is. Uh, you, you still do this thing to yourself where, you know, you waste, you start feeling like you wasted time and stuff, right? I've, so I've heard you do that negative thinking. You still doing that? Not, not, not as much. I, I do fall back into that, but yeah. I get confused. It's like, okay, am I supposed to be egotistical and brag and boast, or am I supposed to be humble and go, you know what, you should be grateful that you're even breathing today, you know, because I, I screwed up so much in my past. I, I mean, both are a little extreme. Just gratitude straight, straight across. You know, it, it's your experience. You embrace it. You love it. You're grateful, and you can use okay. it, and you can use it to help other people. Oh, most definitely. That's what it's all about, giving it away so I can keep it. Mm, yeah. So cool. Yeah, I just wanted to chime in and say hi. All right, man. Know. Always great um, to hear your voice, and I uh, can't wait to see what they do with it for the uh, documentary. It'll be very interesting. Okay, okay I'll keep you posted. All right, thanks. Okay. Uh, uh, that's Anthony Brown, of course. Uh, Anthony had a very long history of addiction and arrests, and oh, my God, it's, it's, it's that story. Um, all right, I'm still... Uh, Trying to get you guys up here. I'm going to wrap up in a few minutes, but I still have time for a couple more calls. Uh, data droll. Do I take the vax? Yes, I did. Uh, I took the Johnson Johnson vaccine and I had a terrible reaction to it. Uh, and then I was thinking about getting the uh, booster, uh, but I thought to myself, you know, probably better if I got Omicron. Boom. That day I got Omicron. And I have since tested my uh, antibody profiles against multiple antigens and I am way high up with uh, neutralizing antibodies. Uh, Toby, what's going on? Your your mic is uh, muted. Uh, I got it. I got it. There Hi. You hey. How are you doing today? Good. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. Thank you. Um, a uh, uh, question. Um, with the trauma, it brought to mind uh, my son. Um, he's uh, 19 and a half, and he has uh, Asperger. I'm sorry, ASD. Mm -hmm. He's on the spectrum. Um, and he has ADD and mood disorder and, you know, they throw everything on there. Um, now, with I've been um, getting a lot of uh, information and researching a lot of things that children who are on the spectrum, um, they have a greater percentage of becoming transgender. Oh, and I was wondering if you could speak to that because um, he, well, they, as we're supposed to say, um, he, uh, they never, my uh, will never, uh, went for boy or girl toys. We never forced anything like that upon him. Um, and, uh, uh this is all new to me. Um, so I was wondering if you could speak to that and also the rise in, um, uh, the children coming out within the schools. Well, I mean, these are super complicated. I, I would just direct <laughs> you. Yeah. I, Deborah So does a lot of review of the literature in this regard, and she's sort of an expert. I, I would sort of direct things towards her. She should know more about autistic spectrum and, and this okay. phenomenon. I have very little experience with this, except to say it makes sense to me I, 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 in the sense that um, autistic children I've worked with uh, do have more... Um, challenges when, when it comes to forming an identity and figuring out who, yes. they, are, who they want to be uh, because yes. so much of the self is built on socio-emotional exchange right 
And if that mm -hmm. is inefficient or ineffective, it becomes really difficult. You're just you're just adrift trying to do it on your own. And uh, it, it, you know, you become, obviously, if there's a lot going on in the environment that uh, sort of mm. influence you, you might be more likely to be influenced. Doesn't mean it's the wrong thing. I'm not put, I'm not passing judgment on it. I'm just saying that's, right. you know, that's could be the very, the very right thing for, for that child to do. Um, mm -hmm. But I would hope, and I don't know this to be true, I hope that the physicians that are selecting treatment regimen, regimens for, let's say, let's say, young adults even that come mm -hmm. in that would like help with a transgender identity i hope they have st data specific for autistic kids or autistic spectrum children and i don't mm -hmm. know if that's out there i don't know but uh toby it's a great question i'll kind of keep an eye, eye out for it okay okay, okay. yeah thank, thank you, you. Um, I, wish I, I, I wish i had more information on that or really knew more something more about it but i just i just do not um all right, one more call from Chuck real quick here, and then I've got to kind of wrap things up. My Plus, my phone's going to run out of battery, and uh, they don't let you charge and do a Clubhouse at the same time. Meantime, let me look quickly at the restreams. See if you have any questions there. Um, mm -mm. No one who's ever been really injured died. I don't know what you're talking about, TS. There we are. Chuck, what's up? Uh, your, mic's, your microphone is muted. Chuck. And then I will answer the agoraphobia question from Shirley. There we go. Good. Uh, can happening? you hear me? I do. What's up? Ah, well, um, uh, 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 question and, and, and comment to the, the young lady with the child on the spectrum. Um, yeah. My heart, my heart goes out to you. Um, I have a two year old that is on the spectrum and it, um, uh, you've you've probably earned your your wings into sainthood because it, it's uh, it is a challenge and and uh, uh, I have a lot of respect for people that have to go through that mm -hmm. now that I'm going through it as well. Um, do you have, do you have support but, from other parents that uh, are in that position? Because because I, I go ahead answer that question first. Yeah. So um, what I uh, so uh, the uh, one. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that I've been studying. I, I, I'm a data analyst at information. So it's probably the, it's so far the only recognized thing. Yes, yes, but, but for what, a what I'm, therapy perspective, I, I understand. From a, I, what I want to get at is what I want to get at is your way of talking about your child is different than many parents who have. Um, change their point of view on having autistic children, I think is the best way to say it. And I think support from other parents like that could maybe help you. Um, oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Because uh, it, it, um, it, they, they, you know, we're talking a lot today about changing our thinking. A and I think there's opportunity here to uh, get support of other parents and to think differently about what, what the challenges are ahead. Okay. Does that make sense? Uh, y yes. Yes, it does. And okay. we're, we're we're still in the early phases of that. And I just, from what I see, there's just so little information and understanding about it. Um, there there, uh, there are the probably last decade, I see yeah. that there's been a lot of new changes. Yes. And there are programs that are exceptional out there. UCLA has a great program uh, on autism and uh, get, get, get access. To, don't just read about things, get access to people and resources that, that are, dealing with this on a regular basis but i i think you will see when you talk to other parents you, you'll you'll change your point of view a little bit i think did you have another question yeah well yes i did yeah. and it was um it was it was about trauma mm. um i i tend to not try to share too much about myself yeah. but um uh i was paralyzed at 19 from the neck down oh goodness uh so uh, I do have some mobility, but I'm quadriplegia. You're with C, um, C what? C5. C5 quad. So you have some hand and, and, and uh, shoulder, and right? Tenodesis, yep, yeah, and yeah, shoulder. Yeah, okay. Um, so uh, um, uh, uh, one thing that I realize is that one, that, again, this is, to me, is a surprise that they're only starting to, like, it, autism is an emotional thing they didn't they didn't address our, our our emotional being they tried to heal us as a body and that was one of my comments before as, and, a, as a quad 
Yes. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. And, Listen, and it's I was gotten so much worse. Uh, oh, I'm sorry to hear that because I know the well, the intent was to make it better, but but I because I've literally so, been in programs where that's what we talked about. <laughs> that's what we we're trying yeah. to do. So they there are more peer support groups. Mm -hmm. uh, so when I was when I was originally paralyzed, uh, I was fortunate because we were treated like football players. Mm -hmm. I was recruited from. I live in the the DMV area, area Maryland, mm -hmm. and uh, I was recruited from Florida to uh to um uh, uh california mm -hmm. but just because there was a large ticket of money associated with me i was institutionalized for a year were you and at the you uh, out within rancho weeks. de las amigas back then uh actually i went to pennsylvania pennsylvania okay. um, mm -hmm. um uh it was a pretty good program but but even then it wasn't much of the emotional piece it's crazy and through my that's crazy my life yeah, and now they only get you in and out in a couple of weeks, and they still don't do anything about your. Crazy. You, know, you get it through peer groups. Oh. Mm. Um, but one of the things, as I've been trying, because I've tried to participate in other support groups, and, and I'm planning to do that for with my child as well to learn mm. more. But and I question: Is this the right recommendation I'm trying to give people? Because I found peer support. Uh, well, I found that that people. Um, no matter what their problem is, it comes back to a self worth issue. Okay. I think. I think. Okay. And my recommendation has always been tried to go, and what I've done to myself is that uh, you need to find yourself, and a way to find yourself is try to help other people. Absolutely. That, that that's and not even about worth. Me. That that's something much yeah. bigger than worth. Yeah. And, and I, I, I said, you know, if you can set yourself in a process. Yeah. Is that when you're feeling like that, go help somebody else yeah. out. And the more yeah. depressed you are, go and help somebody else yeah. out. Yeah. And eventually, yeah. you're going to come back and tire, say, gee, I'm really tired. Mm -hmm. I don't want to help somebody else right now. Mm -hmm. And if you reflect on that, you've done so much for so many other people that you have so much value just from helping so many other people that you have a lot of value. Every individual has a lot of value. And it doesn't matter whether you're paralyzed and can't move very much. Or whether you're, you know, some celebrity, or it always comes back. To, I think to that same thing: how many people you can touch, and reflecting upon that. And I, and I thank you for doing that here. Oh, this uh, today. Uh, no, 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 no. You, 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 you put the nice code on this. You're, you're, you, you. The, the, if if people did not hear your words, I would be shocked, because you're you're coming sure. from a position of challenge, and you've shown resiliency and ability to maintain a positive attitude, and you're still doing what makes a difference which is we need so much more of that today i'm just our breath yeah. is taken away that yeah. you called in today yeah. it's exactly what i was feeling yeah. today and, so. and i can tell you this and i would put that to anybody else mm. uh throughout my life i've heard it from everyone from the office counselor to uh everybody that hey you already get social security why do you want to do this hey you want to why you're not going to succeed why are you trying to do this um i'm very successful i make more money than any of them i have a family a child my own house i drive uh there there is success and you just need to go to one of these support groups and look at some of those other people well if they can you can too that absolutely and and i and i, and I want to direct you to the other parents of autistic spectrum kids for for multiplicity of reasons one is to get more resources not not just support from the parents but to actually get access to quality resources which it sounds like you're kind of looking for and then number two is to learn how to meet these children where they are and, and to and to think differently about this condition and i think other parents will help you do that okay if that, if that makes yeah. sense you uh, got it so what i yep and what i've been telling people mm, I, my child doesn't have a condition yeah she has a superpower she's just yeah. she's different yeah. she's yeah. not less yeah and we just need to figure out what her superpower is yeah Ass and assets and liabilities and assets, else. assets and liabilities it's it's everything about the human we have we all have assets and liabilities chuck thank you so much for calling in. i appreciate it Thank you. All right. And Christina Kay, thank you for the hearts for Chuck. Let's see what else is in there for Chuck. Chuck sounds like an amazing... Mm -hmm, he does indeed. Uh, and that's not a droll who had been uh, been sort of trolling us a bit <laughs> today. Uh, yep, this caller is good. Thank you, SD Louder. 
Uh, what else? Great advice. Thank you. I'll, I'll leave green. Yep. All right. So I think that is the thing to end with. I do not, I don't think we can do better than what Chuck just did. Uh, and we will leave it at that. Chuck does rock, Casey. I agree with that. And TS even, even TS ringing in on Chuck. So whatever you, whatever, uh, and, and of course, Accu Hitman reminding us that hot sauce is the best. So that, thank you for that nice coda on the, on the conversation today with the hot sauce. If those of you are from your mom's house know what that's all about. As usual, if there's some weird, um, greeting or some weird, uh, phrase that you're hearing, it's all from your mom's house. So here's the deal. Um, we will leave it at that. And uh, we'll be back on uh, Caleb by getting this correct. It'll be Monday, right? Monday at four o'clock. I, I I think so. They've been the calendar has been changed a few times, but it looks like it would be yeah, you're actually I believe you're right, four o'clock on Monday. David Swanson coming in Monday at four yep. o'clock. And we have time on Tuesday to give maybe we'll do another caller show. I don't know, we'll see. Uh, and uh, yeah, excellent. And then we'll be gone for a little while and then we'll be back from New York. Is I don't know if I mentioned to you or I said it to Susan, is that somebody was saying to me, how exciting you're going to be doing the show from New York. It's like the Wheel of Fortune from Hawaii. It's just <laughs> just a, the show from a different location. It's like We'll have to have special, special sort of events around uh, us from New York. It's been so long since we've done it. Uh, Caleb, thanks so much for doing the show today. I see it turned out great. Uh, can we talk about our friend Justine for a second real quick before we wrap up? Or is that not for public uh, yet? I don't want to, I don't want to talk about it yet. Not yet. Okay. All right. Yeah. So we'll talk about that down the road somewhere. Uh, and, uh, cause it's very, very interesting. I will hopefully she'll be a part of that conversation. Thank you on clubhouse. Great questions today. Thank you on restream for uh, being so vigilant and for, uh, <laughs> even yeah, having excellent energy. That's what Carol said. That's exactly right. All right. We'll see you on Monday at four o'clock, a little bit different four o'clock Pacific. We'll see you then. Here's the crazy question. Does somebody have a sexual response to this? That's the crazy of question. Of course. <gasps> There's always. No. They're like a classic bear. There's people that are into bears. Yeah. There's always. You some. better believe I'll be coming up in May. <laughs> yep. He's one of them. Ed Asner. Do you think other bears like this lo like looking at him? I think I think there's guys. I think there's girls. Like I Girls? Think, yeah. Totally. Heather, get on the horn here. Ask Dr. Drew is produced by Caleb Nation and Susan Pinsky. As a reminder, the discussions here are not a substitute for medical care, diagnosis, or treatment. This show is intended for educational and informational purposes only. I am a licensed physician, but I am not a replacement for your personal doctor, and I am not practicing medicine here. Always remember that our understanding of medicine and science is constantly evolving. Though my opinion is based on the information that is available to me today, some of the contents of this show could be outdated in the future. Be sure to check with trusted resources in case any of the information has been updated since this was published. If you or someone you know is in immediate danger, don't call me, call 911. If you're feeling hopeless or suicidal, call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 800 273 8255. You can find more of my recommended organizations and helpful resources.